Thank you sponsors. And we're so grateful for you, very appreciative. But before we do anything else, I want to take the opportunity to just thank TAG. Uh, today, I want to go into our uh, content sessions and what an incredible group of companies that are setting an example and doing the right thing to foster inclusion in the workplace. We're so, so grateful for that. So here's what's up next. We have a, our fantastic uh, content sessions. Each session is designed for you to share and get strategies, techniques, and measure to, measures to foster inclusion and innovation. So this afternoon, we have four incredible sessions. First, let's start with a diverse work, I mean, I'm sorry, a diverse world and global workplace. And this is Kelly Gay, and she's a, uh, the chairperson for Venture Atlanta and CEO and board member. And she's also a board member of TAG, so you don't want to miss that one. The, the next one we have is how a thriving ecosystem can be inclusive to black and brown founders. And you definitely don't want to miss this. This is led by Rashawn Williams. He's a partner with Manhattan Ventures. You definitely don't want to miss. Going next, we have transforming an industry from inclusion and innovation. This is led by our very own Stacy Rivers, director of tech, HCM, Warner Media, and TAG board member. And next, we have Culture Beats Strategy, led by Gary Brantley, the CIO of the City of Atlanta, and he's also a TAG board member. So here, each session will be recorded and available for replay. Today, pick a session, get engaged, and I promise you, you're going to enjoy and have great dialogue and an opportunity to just hear some fantastic uh, folks speaking. After the content sessions today, you don't want to miss our keynote with Fred Blankenship. He's the anchor of WSB TV and Jimmy Etheridge, the CEO of North America Accentra. During this session, you will explore some techniques and programs that Jimmy has been able to use across the centers, especially with the clients. And, and this is really about how to get a community to drive inclusion and innovation. So afterwards, we're going to have some serious fun. Now, this is the segment you don't want to miss this, so make sure you come back for this. This is where we're going to talk to someone in our music industry, and we're going to talk about some of the tech technology that's used today in music. And she's a very special guest. I know her personally, and so you don't want to miss that. So before we drop into our content sessions, allow me to just thank a few, um, few people that we must do. Programs like Converge become a reality through energy of the volunteers, the passion and commitment of great leaders and sponsors that invest in TAG and our important causes and our community. We thank Accentra for their second year as the title sponsor and many other sponsors that made Converge possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please join me and take a look in recognizing some of these amazing companies and their organization. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rashawn Williams. We're very excited to host this panel with two of my favorite professional athlete, entrepreneurs slash investors, uh, talking about how a thriving ecosystem can be inclusive to black and brown founders and investors. Um, it's very difficult to follow up after Phyllis Newhouse with her keynote, but we're going to try to do our best. Phyllis is amazing. Uh, one of our business partners and one of the business leaders here in the Atlanta area. And believe anything that she said. <laughs> uh, Williams, a uh, 12-year investment banker, Goldman Sachs, Wachovia Deutsche Bank, and the last 10 years I've been everything between an angel investor and running a VC fund. And I also work with a lot of athletes and entertainers who are either transitioning from athletes to businessmen and investors or have been doing both at the same time. And I'm talking to two guys today who have gone out, gotten their degrees, gotten MBAs, still playing professional sports, started their own VC funds, started their own private equity funds, awesome fathers, awesome husbands, like it just can't get any better. And these guys are really thriving and they're, and they're kind of the blueprint of what we all want to learn in terms of integrating in these different ecosystems. But I think these guys have a unique angle at this how a thriving ecosystem can be inclusive because I personally think that they both came up through thriving ecosystems that have been supporting black athletes for generations. And they learned a lot 
about the pipeline, right? About the culture, about the coaches and the programs and, and helping kids with talent get to the next level. And I think we can learn a lot about how to apply those same lessons to black founders and black investors who want to thrive in the Southwest uh, ecosystem for tech investing and investing, especially here in Atlanta and in Tennessee and, and, and that is in Texas. Um, so I wanted to spend a couple minutes and let them introduce themselves. I'll start it out with Derek Morgan and then I'll pass it over to that. Derek, would you mind introducing yourself, a little bit about your background, especially what you're doing now? I think people would love to hear that. And then we'll pass it over to that and then we'll go into it with a little bit of a Q and A. Cool. Yeah. Appreciate the uh, intro and just for having me a part of this conversation. Uh, happy to dive in. Um, my name is Derek Morgan. I uh, finished up a nine year career all with the Tennessee Titans um, back in 2018 and um, actually attended Georgia Tech. Me and Thad are uh, Georgia Tech alumni and, um, you know, really throughout my career um, have always been interested and curious about the best ways for me to leverage my platform. Um, we're going to dive into this extensively, so I won't park on it, but I really have always felt like I've, I've been blessed with an opportunity um, to really, you know, change and like change and reshuffle the cards for people coming behind me um, that come from neighborhoods and that look like, you know, where a, a lot of us grew up and under underserved, overlooked type of environments. And, um, you know, that's what I spent a lot of the latter part of my career in the NFL thinking through and kind of got um, down this lane of uh, impact investing and aligning my investments with my, um, my values. And so um, since retiring, me and two other co-founders uh, launched Kingdom Group. And what the Kingdom Group essentially is, stands for is a way to um, make an impact in communities through investment in economics. And so, so basically taking what I did on, on the personal side and, and creating a framework to do it at a larger scale with other like-minded individuals. And so uh, that's what we've been doing over the last year or so, uh, been primarily focused on uh, real estate in um, underserved areas, a lot, of, a lot of them being in opportunity zones and have been leveraging the relationships that I built throughout my time in the NFL to you know create a more effective path amazing thank you that we pass it over to you yeah that is young here um 13 year nba vet uh still playing right now with the chicago bulls i've had uh stints with um philadelphia brooklyn indiana and minnesota uh you know as well as the bulls now um pretty much you know i've been dabbling into tech and uh, outside sectors, uh, outside of sports uh, for the past, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Um, always been curious about it. Uh, for me, business has uh, always been one of, the, one of the things I, I've always said I wanted to do um, outside of basketball. I uh, created my own fund called Reform Ventures. Uh, which we're a, a value add fund that basically, um, you know, provides capital to startups and tech companies. Uh, we've made about 40 investments, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, over the course of time in different companies like Airbnb, DraftKings, uh, Pinterest, uh, on down the line to other stuff. Uh, you know, but uh, I've always dived into like real estate. Uh, we, we have reformed real estate interest that, you know, diving into condo buildings, uh, apartment complexes and on down the line. Um, uh, I mean, we, we have so many things that's going on, but for me, um, you know, I'm very, very excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, I've been in a, a extremely different situation. Uh, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to have people in my family that's been handling business since, <laughs> you know, I, I've been born. So I was actually, I was actually kind of raised, uh, in a, a different background, different situation, um, you know, but still kind of grew up, you know, in, in that, that poverty area and stuff like that. You know, these people that were in my family were from a, a whole completely different side. They just kind of took me under their wing and showed me and gave me the blueprint on how to continue to um, handle the business and continue to, uh, you know, add, add, add value to different companies in, in different ways. Uh, a part of what I've been doing uh, has been very, very good. And it's been, uh, you know, in different ways. Uh, whether it's giving back to the community or 
you know, being a, a value add to a small business or a value add to, you know, a, a big business, you know, just through my brand or through who I am as a person. Uh, I've always said that I want to kind of, you know, use basketball to get me in certain areas, but, you know, not let basketball use me. And that's, that's been the biggest thing for me, continuing to just, you know, be a, 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 a crutch that people can kind of lean on for, you know, help and advice uh, just from the stuff that I've kind of learned throughout the path, you know, that I've taken in my career. But uh, for me, you know, like I said, this opportunity is really good because it's a conversation that desperately needs to be had. Um, you know, you know, with me playing basketball, I, I get to be into so many different uh, areas and, and avenues and, and so many rooms to where I can talk to a lot of different people that most most people can't. So it's definitely something that I'm, I'm very happy and aesthetic to, to be a part of. Thank you. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about, and I, Derek and, and, and Thad and I have discussed this many times, most people don't understand how the Silicon Valley and the tech ecosystem actually works. So I want to talk about how it works and why it's thriving for some people so that we can figure out how it can be more inclusive to other people. But I also want to start comparing ecosystems that are thriving right now where African Americans and minorities are thriving in those ecosystems and what we can learn from those ecosystems that we are thriving in to more fairly get access to the ones that we are not. So Silicon Valley. So for those of you who don't know me, I've invested in over 140 startups, uh, early investor in Ring and PillPack, Coinbase, Robinhood, Dropbox, Live. Um, I lost more money on investments than I even have the time to explain. I just named the ones that did well. (laughs) Um, But what I noticed from investing in over 130 companies, and I would say 128 of them looked exactly the same. They were like these white male founders who got a ton of money from Silicon Valley. Here's what it normally looked like. This is how I learned the tech business. A founder was probably from Stanford, probably from MIT, probably from Harvard, put up his own money into an idea that he had to incorporate it, maybe hire someone, build it out a little bit. So let's say he put anywhere between $10,000 and $50,000 of his own money whether he was on a credit card or he sold his 401k or he just had that money. And half the time that founder was technical. So they can code. They knew how to code. They didn't have to hire engineers, right? Then after they were able to have the business set up and have their idea and their pitch deck down and maybe one person on their team, uh, they then went to family and friends and raised, let's say, 50K to 200K. So now... They have 50K to 200K additional capital. They can hire a few more engineers and create a minimum viable product and get it in the hands of some users or some customers, or at least create a sign up list of people that said, hey, I would love to use this app or this product when it is done. After they raised money from family and friends, that 50K to 200K, they then went to angel investors in their community. They went to the Georgia Tech alumni network, the Harvard alum, the Stanford alums. They are hanging out at the coffee shops in Silicon Valley. And they raised, you know, 400K to 600K from angel investors, 25, 50K checks each. Now they've raised 700 something thousand dollars. They already have an MVP. They already have a product. They already have a few customers. They already have a little bit of traction. Then they go to Silicon Valley VCs and say, hey, Look at what I have. Look at the traction I have. Look at the team I have. Look at the product I have. Look at my total addressable market. And Silicon Valley is oozing over them. Like, hey, yeah, I love this. I want to give you $5 million at a $15 or $20 million pre-money valuation. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And they're trying to grow that thing really fast. And I would say 20% of the time, this is not the founder's first time doing it. (laughs) Okay? So that's the ecosystem that exists in Silicon Valley. Now, What tends to happen with minorities is a little different because of the wealth gap. So because of the wealth gap, and I I looked at this recently in Boston, Derek, I didn't tell you this, but I was talking to someone in Boston and they told me that the, the average net worth of a white person in Boston is like $350,000. And the average net worth of an African American in Boston is negative $40. Okay, so if you're a Boston African-American or minority and you're trying to compete to get funding from Silicon Valley, you don't have the money to your startup. 
you're, prob- you're probably not an engineer just looking at the numbers. You don't have any family, friends, or fools that can give you $50,000 to $2,000. You don't know any angel investors. Maybe you try to get a call with that. Maybe you try to get a call with Derek, right? But they get so many calls because they're celebrities that they can't take all of them. So what you do is you go to Silicon Valley with a PowerPoint presentation and you ask that same VC that invested in that white founder, hey, I see you gave him $5 million at a $20 million pre. And they gave him a check and then they tell you as a minority founder, you're a little too early. So the white founder says, thank you, and does a press release in Crunch Bay or Tech Crunch. The black founder says, they're actually partially right because of the wealth gap, but that's not the whole story. This ecosystem doesn't exist for people who come from lower net worth and lower income communities. However, which is the reason I'm going to talk to you guys, let that same kid be six, seven and be a junior in high school and is, is a cornerback or a tight end or is a point guard, right? Like in high school, the ecosystem will stun that kid. He will have the best shoes. He will have a car. He's getting money from different schools to come there. He's like traveling all around the country on the AAU teams. He's getting every resource. Even the drug dealers in the community are supporting that kid, right? Everybody in the family will chip in to help that kid because they see that there's a path for him becoming a millionaire and making it out. They do not see that path for him being Mark Zuckerberg. There's no black Mark Zuckerberg, right? So... With that being said, and my overly dramatic explanation of this whole thing and simplification, I want to start with Derek. So in your experience, I see so many successful NFL players like yourself who come from lower income, middle income, and wealthy black families that get sucked into this ecosystem. And if they're talented, if they work hard, if they train hard, there's a direct path for them to get to the NFL. There are people that support them. There are all of these things. Can you talk about the NFL ecosystem and how it is inclusive to young urban minorities and what things the NFL does right? We know a lot of things they do wrong, (laughs) but what the NFL does right that we can probably learn from and replicate in the tech community for young African-Americans who want to be included in the tech ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. But I think it encapsulates <laughs> really what the environment is and what the ecosystems are in these different you know industries. And when I think about the NFL, I almost got to take a step back and look all the way at the top. Right. When you t- when you think about the 32 owners across the league, you know, the only color that they care about is green. They don't care mm-hmm. white, black, brown. They don't. It, it doesn't matter to them because they're a very bottom line motivated business owner, which all business owners, you know, should be obviously depending on what you're in. That's another story, but like the bottom line dictates the decision-making from a top down perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you start at the top of the food chain and you work yourself down as a, as a team owner, you always got to be thinking about the pipeline of talent. Like, what does it look like from, you know, the little the little league level all the way through? That's why owners were getting so nervous when all of the still to this day, all the conversations around CTE and like traumatic brain injury, like you're essentially hurting your pipeline and your your talent pool. Right. right. Because people are taking their kids out of the sport of football. Mm -hmm. So if you're an owner it behooves you to support initiatives that support the cultivation of talent. Mm-hmm. So if if I'm an athlete and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, it's an old steel town outside of Philly, mm-hmm. but we're known for athletics, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the actual city of Coatesville is predominantly um, black and brown, mm-hmm. but the district is, is you know, it's very uh, diverse, yeah. but our, our way out, at least my way out was through athletics, right? Mm-hmm. And if you are able to showcase that you have talent, in a, in, a, in a particular sport, the infrastructure and the framework is there and it's, and it's in place. It's around you to keep thrusting you to that next echelon and that, mm-hmm. that next level. There's not as many barriers if you have talent to get from level to level, right? You don't need money. You don't need net worth. You don't need that friends and family round. You know? no, all, you gotta, all you got to do is know how to dribble, run fast, <laughs> jump high. 
and the, the, the path will be laid out before you. So I but think whose that, responsibility is it to put that infrastructure? Do you think it's the NFL's responsibility or is it the urban population's responsibility to put those resources around or both? I, I would say both because you don't want to be too dependent on a corporation like the NFL. Yeah. Um, so you got to be able to do what you can to like to create homegrown talent and to, and to cultivate that and to create yeah. opportunities. Cause let's be real. There, there, there is talent in places that, that, that do get overlooked, mm -hmm. right? Maybe there was somebody that was better than Jordan that didn't get the break that, 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 yeah. that they needed, right. Yeah. For better or worse. So I think it is, uh, the responsibility of the actual, you know, the actual local community to create those yeah. opportunities. I love it. And, and that, so I grew up on the South side of Chicago during the Jordan era, speaking of Jordan. And I'm telling you, man, when I grew up, every kid was wearing Jordan shoes. We're playing video games with Jordan on it, had a Bulls jacket, carried a basketball around, going to a game or not, shooting on the courts in winter, spring and summer, had posters on their wall of basketball players and all of their heroes are basketball players. It's no coincidence that we have a pipeline and a thriving ecosystem. Right. So from your perspective, what do you think the basketball ecosystem is doing that we can learn from in tech and investing? Because ultimately we want investors like you two who both have your own funds, who are both looking for deals, who are both looking for investors for deals to invest with you to be as included in the private equity and tech space as you were in the basketball and football space. But we need to tell people how did you get included in basketball that kind of sucked you in and you had the talent and how could you get integrated into this thriving ecosystem here in the Southeast? Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, I kind of got into basketball. Um, my dad played. So that was, uh, that was one way in because he played and uh, I understood the game through his eyes a little bit uh, with him taking me out on the court each and every day. But uh, as far as getting better and thriving, as far as that, I mean, it's all in place. Like if you can, like like Derek said, if you can show that you can run, jump, just be a little bit athletic and show potential, because that's what guy, that's what guys are, are are literally getting drafted off now. Just overall mm -hmm. potential. Um, when I came up, you know, guys were athletic, but. Now they put in, they've put a lot of things in place now as far as like the best technology, the the best doctors. You now you got kids, they're going getting surgery and they're coming back jumping four to five inches higher. So mm -hmm. so everything's in place now for kids to kind of thrive and get to that point because think about like the NBA, it's a revolving circle. So like every three or four years, you have a new group of talent that's, that's ready to come in prime to take over the league. And this talent yeah. is not, it's not older. It's only mm -hmm. getting younger. Mm -hmm. So, so you have a, a wave of, of talent that comes in that gets younger and younger and younger. And mm -hmm. every time, every time it's like a three or four win, three or four year window. So with that three or four year window, now you're looking at, you know, guys uh, having these ecosystems that's kind of cultivating these these kids to kind of be pros as opposed mm -hmm. to them just being regular high school athletes and living their lives. They start mm -hmm. becoming a, 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 a in, in the business model or in the tool or in the the on the in the food chain, as we per se, you know, when when they're 14, 15 years old, when they, exactly. they start to, they start to get ranked. You know, you get guys that's in the top 10. OK, we need to we need to get him into our circle. And then now the league is even going younger. They, the league, just, the league just started junior. They started junior NBA. So now they can see AAU kids within a junior NBA. You know, you have mm -hmm. players. They have their own AAU programs. Now, I have my own AAU program, Team Thad, and it's a, a Nike sponsor program. So it's not. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing, too, is it's not just the, the NBA. You have all these major corporations and, and shoe brands that's looking at them also because you have to think about it. Now they're they have to keep these kids primed to for for displaying and marketing product. Yeah. When they get to the NBA. So so why wouldn't they they put trainers in place or why wouldn't they put all these different recruiters and scouts and, and different in place to make sure that these kids are thriving and making sure that they're they're getting put in the right places like I can tell you from, from my personal experience, I was a, a top five player in the country uh, growing up. Uh, it was Greg Oden, Kevin Durant in front of me. So, so <laughs> in, in, my, in my high school class. So, 
<laughs> so in my my McDonald's All American game, twenty two of the twenty four guys made it to the NBA. Wow. So that should that should tell you right there, like how many how the the ecosystem is and how it's striving and how they're breathing breathing players to come into the league and, and they're putting it they're putting it in in their faces like okay we're gonna provide you with the tools and the resources and we're gonna make sure that you're a pro you know but you know it, it's a it's it's a reason why it's a billion dollar operation <laughs> mm -hmm. oh for sure and you know what's interesting you mentioned your dad being an influence in basketball. And I know you also had like an uncle that was an influence in business. So that seems to be a common thread, not just in sports, but also in business, right? One thing that I think both of you are saying, if I were to tie it to the tech ecosystem, is you had all of these systems in place that were training you guys, that were ranking you guys, exposing you guys, and giving you the facilities, giving you the coaches, and giving you the opportunities. In the tech ecosystem, we have accelerators, we have incubators, we have these conferences, we have coding schools, and we have all of these things. And to go to an earlier point that Derek made about the bottom line, even if some of the owners are even racist, they're still out here hiring the best black talent. So I, I happen to believe that if you had a founder that came up through the ranks like you did, number three in your high school class, right? But he comes through the tech rank, even if there is some bias that they can potentially break through that bias if, if their numbers speak for themselves, if, if someone can like help get them to that point. So I think we need more young kids to go through accelerators, these incubators, conferences, and these coding schools. And what I like about you two, you guys are leading the way as an example. You are the influencers. They're not going to listen to a finance nerd like me tell them to go through coding school. If they see you guys getting your MBAs and starting VC funds and investing in startups and starting your own businesses and private equity funds, they want to do that because you're their hero. You're on their wall. Right. So I love the fact that you guys are doing this and I think it's going to bring a tremendous amount of value. Um, so I want to spend a, a couple minutes shifting gears a little bit um, and talk about your experiences as investors. OK, I know firsthand that both of you have been reaching out proactively to get in these ecosystems that you have not been a part of earlier on in your career. So I'll start with you, Derek. Derek, what has your experience been like reaching out to private equity, venture capital, family office investors as you create your funds, as you invest in real estate and all of these different impact initiatives you have? And what what words of encouragement and advice would you give family office investors if they wanted to partner with a guy like you or just be inclusive to people like you, if you have any? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting um, thing to think about. Um, I've always been kind of the one that's been getting pitched and, you know, like, hey, <laughs> right. my fund, right? right. <laughs> and now it's kind of like reverse. And um, quite frankly, man, you, you, there are certain stigmas that, that I deal with that I'm sure you deal with as well, that even maybe Rashawn, you as being a, a black man in, in the, um, the tech and financial industry, there are certain stigmas that you have to deal with some, from time to time. You know, every every room, you know, I come in, it's, it's obviously the conversation, you know, goes around football and how the yeah. Titans did that last Sunday. And you know, that's cool. That's your way in. Right. Um, but it's kind of like what do you do once you get in the room. You know what yes. I'm saying? So like we can get into the rooms, but it's just like, how do we keep the momentum rolling? And I, I think the biggest part, the biggest thing that I wish I would have done a little bit better at was um, networked while I was at school in Georgia Tech. And, you yeah. know, I'm at probably you like you probably we all went to school with millionaires and didn't even know it. Like those engineer air, like encoders, like we probably were sitting next to those guys and didn't yeah. even know it. And so when you're in when you're in the, the athletic world, you're so tunnel, you know, tunnel vision on getting to that next stage. And sometimes mm -hmm. you miss out on the relationship building. And so I would yeah. always say, like, even when I look up now, it's like my network and my access to capital has all been a direct result of intentional networking and getting in these these, yes. these, these circles and ecosystems of people where maybe like they would have initially looked at me as just a football player. But once they get to know me and understand what I'm what I'm about and what my mission is, 
then it's a, a way warmer introduction or a conversation around, hey, would you want to invest into this project because we're mission aligned and you can you, you know that I got a good yes. team around me. So it's, it's a lot of it's relationship driven. Oh, for sure. For sure. And that I, I know you don't mind reaching out to people at all. <laughs> um, but yeah. I want to let everyone that's listening here know if you are a founder, these two gentlemen are doing amazing things as investors. And if you are a family office or an investor yourself, you should absolutely reach out to them to include them in your deal flow, to talk to them about raising capital from LPs. These guys are open for business and literally two of the smartest guys I know, regardless of them being professional athletes, just two of the smartest guys I know. Um, that what has been your experience kind of networking in these different worlds that we traditionally have not been in those ecosystems and any words of advice to people who want to make it more inclusive for us? Like what can they do to try to make it more inclusive for us? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, my experience has been uh, pretty, pretty good for for the most part, simply because, like, um, I think people kind of take a liking to me, <laughs> just uh, for, the, for the simple fact that, like, I'm I'm very laid back, I'm chill, and um, you know, I do the homework. I think that's one of the biggest things. Like, I do the work, and uh, I put a lot of time into not just basketball, but into the business side of things. So, um, and and I've always wanted to be a, a person that can. When I walk into the room, I can speak to somebody who who whose net worth is zero to a person whose net worth is a billion to a person whose net worth is thousands and millions. So I, I like to be able to inter, intermingle between the, the different people. And I think that's what's been really well for me, uh, being able to intermingle through the different people, being able to hold those conversations and, and be able to intrigue people with how much I, I know um, about the, the tech ecosystem or the startup um, uh, ecosystem for me that's yeah. i think that's been big for me um you know i think how we can you know get more people more inclusive is you know getting getting more people involved with the networking aspect so you know is if you have a chance and an opportunity to go and meet somebody go and meet them if you have a chance to you know um go to a a, a dinner that has a lot of professionals and business people in there go to it yeah. You know, just I, I think that's the one of the biggest things. A lot of people like we have we have it right here at the at the, you know, the tip of our fingers. But sometimes we kind of drop the ball as far as like going to these different things or mm -hmm. or, you know, taking taking the liking to, you know, certain people and stuff like that. You know, but because, you know, we're built a, a certain different type of way. But for me, I've always been one person that, that's been very intrigued with everything that goes on outside of the basketball side of things. Like I can, yes, I can play basketball. That's easy. But it's, can I do this business thing? You know, you know what I'm saying? So can I do the business thing? Can I do it? You know, so as much as I'm, as much time as I'm putting in on the court, I'm putting in, in the classroom, being a student of, of business, being a student of trying to get into the tech world or, or not trying to get into it. I'm in it now, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <major> way, <bro. laughs> okay. But, uh, but 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 yeah, it's just a, a lot of different ways that you can do it. I think you know, for us to be more inclusive, we have to take the time and really uh, put forth the effort into in learning these different things and learning the different avenues about how this this ecosystem actually works before we can actually yes. blame it on somebody else. You know what right. I'm saying? Right. So, well, it's going so to be time. both ends, right? Like, right. we're responsible right. for what we're responsible for, but a part of the reason why we're speaking on this panel now is because we want to let everyone know our view is that we're doing the work on our ends and we're open for business. We want to do business with everyone. We don't care about political affiliation and all of that stuff. Right. We do business and take care of our families like everybody else. And the last thing I'll say, and we're going to wrap this up in a second. Um, what I love about athletes entering into the investment in the tech world is you guys usually apply the three things that help you become very, very successful in sports to these other industries. And you do it better than other people. Um, the, the, the first thing you do is you guys are very competitive. <laughs> it's like super, like you live to compete and you have to be that way if you're a professional athlete. And in tech and in venture capital and in real estate, it's the same concept. You have to get those returns, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, you guys know how to have myopic focus. If anyone talks to Derek over the last couple of years, anyone talks to that, they know Reform Ventures, they know Kingdom Group. There's no question whatsoever of what these guys are focused on and they're open for business. And then last but not least, 
surprisingly, you guys respond very well to coaching, right? Like you align yourself with people, advisors, you listen to them, you get coached by them, and then you execute very well. So for, for closing words here, I would love for you guys to just talk about one project that's really important to you that you're focused on, and then tell people where to reach you on social media uh, for your business or for yourself. I'm Rashawn underscore Williams on Instagram. And, uh, and Derek, you want to talk about maybe Kingdom Group for a second and then how people can reach out to you if they want to support. And then that will pass it over to you and we'll be done. We'll open up a Q&A afterwards. Yeah. Do you want me just to kind of give a high level of kingdom and then transition? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just a quick spill and then where to yeah. find you on social. Yeah, sure. So Kingdom Group, we um, launched as an impact investment um, fund, really. Um, we've been more so focused on real estate over the last year, mainly in uh, underserved areas, opportunity zones. Um, we bring collective you know, net, not, not net worth, but collective influence to our deals, whether it's, you know, social capital, we like working with other influencers and family offices that are really mission aligned, looking for in ways to positively impact the community. So um, mm -hmm. we're here in Nashville, uh, Atlanta, and um, out of the Philadelphia area as well. So we're at Kingdom Group. So Kingdom is uh, K-N-G-D-M, no vowels, kingdomgroup.com. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at D-M-O-R-G, D-M-O-R-G-91. And you're also in a movie about healthy and, and, and plant-based. Yeah, <laughs> and on Netflix about eating plant-based, thanks to my wife, who's a chef. There we go. There we go. All right, Thad, quickly. Uh, Thad is young of uh, Reform Ventures, uh, www.reformventures.com. Uh, you can find me at thad.young21. Um, for the, for the most part, Reform Ventures is a, a value add fund that basically, uh, you know, adds value and, you know, with funds or with, you know, um, our networking experiences and our, our pipeline and our, our partnerships uh, with other funds or, you know, with, you know, individuals or, or lining different people up with um, companies that can kind of work together with, within our ecosystem. Um, we're, we've been doing a lot of stuff over the past four or five years uh, diving into tech and startups, but not only just doing that, but diving into real estate as well. Um, that's how we kind of actually started out. And uh, now we're starting to actually try to get into the franchising business. Um, so, you know, doing a lot of different things, very, very diverse. Uh, we try to keep it super diverse. And, you know, like Rashawn said, we're open for business. So whoever wants to send decks, portfolios, or, you know, even just link up and, and have conversation, you know, just put, put something on each other's mind, uh, networking. Uh, we're here, we're open for business. Um, you can uh, reach out to info at reformventures.com with all pitch decks and everything that, that you want to talk about. All right. Well, look, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you got something out of it. We're going to open it up for Q&A and let's thank Derek Morgan and Thad Young for joining us today. And uh, we'll open it up for questions now. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. I just want to uh, first say I'm Scott Williford, the CEO and founder of VLink Solutions. We, uh, we're the company that is uh, hosting this event on our platform. Uh, this platform is available across the nation now, so thank you so much for TAG, and, and we're big supporters of TAG, and we're a sponsor of TAG. We uh, want to remind you, if you are just coming into the main stage, if you refresh your browser, you should see a Q&A button that will allow you to actually submit questions to this esteemed panelist. And so to start off with, guys, I, too, am a Georgia Tech alum, and just want to say together we swarm. Uh, it's kind of neat seeing you guys uh, on a Zoom call instead of on the court uh, or playing your sport and doing the things that you guys do when I watched you uh, years past. But my first question to kind of kick us off is that, you know, you guys went to the great institution down there on Trade Avenue, tra the, what do they call it, North Avenue Trade School with me. I got out a little bit before you did. But uh, I want to know, what is it going to take to get you guys back engaged into the technology ecosystem there at Georgia Tech with uh, all the things that TAG is involved in down there? So just kind of kick it off with that question. Uh, you, want, <clears throat> you want to go first? Uh, I'll go first. <laughs> no. uh, I think uh, what will get us kind of back into it uh, is more um, – 
I, I know that Georgia Tech has like an accelerated program and stuff like that. So just uh, going and, you know, seeing some of the stuff that's being put through those accelerated programs to just diving in with some of the students. Uh, you know, my stint at Georgia Tech was very, very short uh, simply because I was a one and done. But um, I still have uh, managed to, you know, mold and foster a lot of relationships there. And I think that's one of the, the things that uh, people have to value. And, uh, and that's how you kind of get back into the ecosystem, just uh, making sure that, you know, you take those meetings and making sure that you, uh, you know, include yourself in, in whatever's going on on campus, you know, whether it's the accelerator programs or it's uh, people that's um, just, you know, sitting in these engineering classrooms that's uh, building up the next, you know, uh, life changing or world changing uh app or or um platform so you know just doing that just getting back into that ecosystem is is definitely huge you know but you have to voice it you know when you want to kind of be involved or or be with something yeah i, I would just say you know to piggyback off of that is really getting tapped into the alumni network and you know we wanted to, we went to, we all went to school with a lot of successful people um and so i think uh for us as athletes per se, um, I think it's going to be is we have to be very intentional about how we um, cultivate those relationships with with our alumni network and you know creating environments to do so. I think is is very key. You know, Phyllis Newhouse has been telling me about all the wonderful work that Chris Kloss is doing at Georgia Tech. Scott, I'm sure you know him well. Um, so I would love to get you guys reconnected if you're not already connected to Phyllis and Chris. And obviously, Scott is going to be our go-to guy as an alum. <laughs> so I'm sure we can make we can facilitate that. And that's, that's very important for these guys as well. Um, Scott, thank you very much for uh, for passing over to us. We can go into some of these questions that we see that are teed up now. Um, one of the things that's important for athletes that a lot of people don't realize, minority and African American athletes are very important to the Black tech ecosystem as not only you know, founders of companies, angel investors of companies, brand ambassadors of companies, like you guys just run the gamut. Um, we need to surround you guys and support you more in terms of helping you get into these other ecosystems that you aren't privy to while you're an athlete. So one of the questions that was asked was, how do you go about creating and identifying the next kind of Michael Jordan in tech a young Michael Jordan in tech and, and, and backing that type of person so that not only the minority ecosystem and the minority investors that you're investing in can get that early funding or whatever, but even outside of the minority ecosystem, you could just invest in these earlier guys. And I know just to give you a little view here, Thad is always calling me about the next greatest, you know, founder out there. So I know he can talk about this for hours and Derek and I talk about this as well. How do you guys go about finding the next great thing when you're looking, you know, as athletes into the investing world? Uh, for me, it's just, uh, you know, having a process. Um, I think that was the biggest thing for me, just creating a process. And, you know, because as an athlete, you know, we get tons and tons of deal flow, tons and tons of people that are sending us a lot of different stuff. So, you know, for me, I think for me, it was just kind of uh, building the team and kind of building that um that process and having that the the right people in place to kind of help me uh, figure out who's going to be the next Michael Jordan in tech or, or, you know, how to invest with, you know, these new founders or these, are these different people that's uh, building these different platforms and uh, different software companies and stuff like that. So for me, it was just a more of a kind of just building and having a process and just building out, um, you know, uh, uh, we call it due diligence, you know, building out a due diligence package, you know, for, for us to kind of look by, look at and then figuring out how to kind of get into them. But another thing too, is we build a lot of good relationships with all these different founders. Um, and that's what kind of helps us too, um, just being able to build those relationships and, you know, um, manage those relationships, you know, because sometimes those relationships can mold to be something uh, completely different and you may not do business together, but you can pass them off to some other business or they can pass you Absolutely. off to some other business. So Absolutely. I think those are some of the things just kind of, you know, building a relationship, but also having a process uh, in mind when you're doing all this different stuff. Um, and then, you know, just having, having people that you can kind of fall back on and actually do. Yeah. And um, 
And Derek, I want to pass it over to you and I'll let you take us home because I know we're running out of time here. But any other thoughts about that or any other comments that you wanted to, to add to it? Yeah, all, all what that said, I agree with. And it's really just about, you know, repetition and creating muscle memory um, and looking at different in deals. And you start to see pattern recognition to say, OK, this probably isn't going to check out because of X, Y, Z. But here are some some of the fundamentals that, you know, every founder or startup should have, per se. And then kind of like when you go through your due diligence is like being able to have people like you, Rashawn, to you know, call up and say, hey, look, you know, you've seen other companies like this. Tell me, your, you know, give me some feedback. But then really getting to know the founder and understanding like what they're made up of. And like they may not be they may, may not have the sexiest presentation, but maybe they have some of the intangibles from a work ethic or a perseverance and a, you know, uh, being able to be flexible and create creative. So like there are certain intangibles that may not, you know, necessarily like be black and white on a presentation or from a n- number standpoint, but maybe the founder is very talented. So it's just a lot, uh, a lot to do with, with uh, repetition. You got it. You got it. Well, look, I think we're out of time here, unless they tell us otherwise. I, I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, making yourselves available. Always good talking to you. I think you guys are inspiring a whole new generation of not only athletes, but non-athlete who want to go into investing um, and, and running their own fund. So without further ado, we would like to conclude this panel. Thank these gentlemen for joining, and we'll pass it over to Phyllis Newhouse. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you, Rashawn. Uh, that was just awesome. What an em- engaging set of discussions. And uh, you know, to hear from uh, so many uh, different uh, guys that are doing great things, we're just so grateful. 